Good afternoon. You are in the web applications track. Um, this is the talk, How I Met Your Girlfriend, and I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Sammy Kankar. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is How I Met Your Girlfriend. Um, it will hopefully be a little more interesting or less interesting, I'm not sure. But basically, we're going to talk about some pretty cool attacks and How I Met Your Girlfriend using those attacks. Uh, just briefly, a little bit about who I am. Uh, I am, what's so funny? It's just Lady Gaga. <laughs> I am a security researcher for fun. I do it on the side. Uh, I love it. It's great stuff. I get to meet great people like you guys um, and learn a lot from you guys, too. Uh, you may know me as the author of The Sammy Worm on MySpace a couple years back. Um, it was a, a virulent XSS worm. Uh, I co-founded the company Phonality. We make IPPBX phone systems. Uh, if you're familiar with Trixbox, uh, we developed that and, and some other really cool phone systems for small to mid-sized businesses. And uh, I love Lady Gaga, but I'm going between Kesha and Lady Gaga right now. They're both so amazing. <laughs> anyway, a couple of years ago, I did that, uh, just a little, a little more intro. I, did that MySpace worm, and it got me in a little bit of heat. So I ended up getting raided. Uh, the Secret Service came to my house. They took all my computers, my cell phone, so on and so forth. Uh, about a year after that, I lost all computer use. Uh, basically, no computer use ever. Um, and did the whole probation. It was like, it was like AOL in real life. Um, <laughs> And unfortunately, I was, not, I was not allowed to go on MySpace anymore. Uh, so sorry to all the tweens out there. But after, after a couple of years, I was able to get it all reduced. It's all revoked. I'm, I'm back to normal. I'm a regular guy. I'm allowed to touch computers. I'm allowed to have an iPhone or Android, whatever. And uh, I'm back. So hopefully I have some cool, cool new attacks for you guys that, that should be interesting. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk, be talking about the web. Um, the reason I'm talking about the web is I don't think the web is necessarily the most interesting thing. I think uh, there, there's so much cool security stuff going on. You, know, you have hardware hacking. There's so many good talks this year on you know, phone privacy and GSM. And um, you know, there's obviously reverse engineering and, and so many other topics that I personally think are really interesting. Uh, and I don't mean to pigeon myself, pigeonhole myself into web. But, you know, with that said, the web does a lot of really cool stuff for you. You know, you have web browsers, which are basically, it's a code distribution channel. You have this application that is running on every person's computer in the world. Every single person in the world is running this application and can execute your code. It's like when Apple came out with the, the App Store, right? They made a distribution channel to run other apps, whether they be malicious or not. But the App Store does, uh, they do sanity checks where the web doesn't. So it's just amazing what you can do with the web. Another thing is it's so powerful. You can, uh, you can talk in so many ways that even your web browser doesn't know that it's, that it's communicating. So we'll get into that in a little bit. So as, as I typically do, you know, I'm usually just browsing on social networks as these talks often start, <laughs> looking at pictures of girls. And uh, I see this amazing woman. Anna Ferris. Uh, I'll have to thank Arsh Arshan, Arshan. <laughs> uh, Arshan de Bursiagi for this one. He introduced me to Anna Ferris. Um, and ever since, I I've been in love since yesterday. So I <laughs> so made my talk, and I had to bring her in. So as I was checking out her profile, I was like, man, I need to, I need to meet her. Right? She looks like the kind of girl I want to know. How do I meet her? And when you're on Facebook, you know, the first thing you do, you try to go to the pictures. It's restricted. You try to look at her info, maybe. I usually don't look at the info. I just look for the pictures. But at that point, I go to the info, and I say, ooh, in a relationship. I'm like, ooh, that's not good. You can't. It's harder to meet someone when they're in a relationship. It's not in an open relationship. It's not complicated, unfortunately. <laughs> So who is this guy? So I look, up, I look him up. I look, look into who he is. He's some big shot, 
certified information security specialist professional, CEO of Sec Theory, co-author of this awesome book called XSS Exploits, Cross-Site Scripting Attacks and Defense, author of Detecting Malice, co-developer of Clickjacking, which is really cool, with Jeremiah Grossman, who is also really cool, this guy run hackers.org and slackers.org, certified ass. I think we can, we can all agree he actually has the certificate application security specialist, it's true. A man who needs no introduction, Robert R. Snake Hansen. Don't clap, don't. Um, now, this is a problem, right? He is dating this amazing woman who I think would really like me if she got to know me. <laughs> but it's really hard to get in there. So, how do I systematically destroy their relationship? <laughs> the first thing is, you know, I know a little bit about computers and, and obviously security, things like that. You know, maybe I, can, maybe I can attack him. Maybe I can attack him, do a little manipulation there, and then go after her. The problem is I'm dealing with a pretty tough target, right? This guy obviously understands security. He's probably much more secure than, than most people. He probably, you know, I don't know, turns off JavaScript and does whatever he can, runs all the, uh, all the security software, has a firewall, so on and so forth, and probably doesn't click on, you know, Farmville ads that often, <laughs> um, even for the extra points. So, I can't, I really don't think I'll be able to attack him. You know, obviously you can attack anyone if you try hard enough and you spend enough time. There has to be an easier way. I can attack a target who I know is secure. So, you don't attack the target. You attack what they use, right? Every day we're using other things. We're using our cell phones, we're using websites, we're using our bank, whatever. So, let's do that. What I want to do is I want to get into our snake's Facebook. That's my goal. So what are we gonna do? I'm not gonna XSS him, right? He's not gonna fall for that. He's not gonna fall for some CSRF on a page. He's probably not gonna enter his credentials into a, a website that, that uh, ends in .ru. Um, well, except that one time for that mail order thing, but. <laughs> so Facebook, we'll, we'll take a quick look here. Facebook, if you look, is run by PHP. Today it's actually, uh, some of you are probably familiar, it's actually running something called Hip Hop, which is their own impl implementation of PHP. I think it compiles PHP into C++. It's not full PHP, but it's, uh, it's, I think, most of it. I believe it's open source at this point. But anyway, they're running PHP. So why PHP? Well, it's an extremely common web language, right? I'm sure all of you are familiar, at least heard of PHP. Lots of websites use it. It's very, it's very easy for development. There's lots of rapid development frameworks for it, like CakePHP, uh, Kohana, CodeIgniter, things like that. Uh, it, it's easy to get a website up and running really quickly. So what we're gonna look at is PHP sessions. PHP sessions are, uh, are basically what happens when you Type in, when you go to a website and let's say you authenticate, for example, you enter your credentials and you get a session. Typically that session is a, a random string and that's either passed in URL or it's passed in a cookie. So cookies, they allow us to, they allow a website to store information locally to you to essentially track you as you browse through that website. And more complicated ones will allow you, will allow tracking across multiple websites, but we won't get into that. Um, the cookie basically allows you, you know, you go to a website, you log in. When you go to another page, it doesn't have to re-authenticate you. It already knows that you're logged in. So, why don't we look at PHP sessions, PHP cookies. Let's see how those work. So, I ripped open PHP. PHP is open source, so we get to take a look at, you know, all of the source code. So, here what we see is basically the session start function. If you're familiar with PHP, you may have used the session start function. It's the de facto standard for starting a session in PHP. If you already have a session established, if as the client 
uh, if you have the session established, it'll reuse your existing session. Um, essentially what you get is you get a random identifier that's stored locally, and then the server will contain all the actual session data that's, that identifies with that random identifier. So if you look at this function, one thing really happens. The, the, the primary thing is you get a random string, and that random string is produced in this PHP session create ID function in session.c. We're just gonna go, we're gonna go over a little bit of C code, um, and we'll, we'll go into some other stuff after that. But if we see here, we're, doing, we're looking at a couple of things. You can see we have, uh, we create this buffer, and it, it in, includes a couple of different things. It includes the remote adder. That's your IP address. That's 32 bits. 32 bits of randomness, entropy. Then what happens is it takes the epoch uh, from the get time of day. So basically, the seconds since January 1st, 1970. How many seconds has that been? That's what the epoch is, or Unix time. That's also stored in this random identifier. Um, after that, microseconds. That's another 32 bits. Microseconds is basically how many microseconds in a second. So as soon as you, let's say, go to facebook.com, you type in your username, you type in your password, and you authenticate, you get this cookie. They take your remote ad, uh, your IP address, they take your epoch, the time you logged in, they take the microseconds from the system, the time you logged in, and they also use this thing called LCG value. This is just a random number, that's 64 bits. Um, after that, they also SHA-1, which is a type of hash. Uh, they also, it may MD5, it may use SHA-1, you can also use your own um, hashing if you'd like to basically hash that random string and produce this random identifier that's unique to you that basically says, you know, I am whomever, I'm logged into Facebook, and I would like to, from now on, you know I'm logged in, so I get all my permissions or, or whatever. The same thing happens when you log into your bank. So if we look, again, here's how much entropy we have. We have IP address, 32 bits, epoch, 32 bits, microseconds, 32 bits, a random value, 64 bits. It's a total of 160 bits. Um, if you SHA-1 that, you still get, uh, SHA-1 is also 160 bits. So if I were to brute force this, for example, there's no way I'm gonna get it. Just a, a little primer, I'm sure a lot of you are, are knowledgeable in this, um, but a lot of the time, you know, especially, especially in web, we don't have to deal with bits, and bits kind of get confusing. It's like, is 64 bits twice 32 bits? Or is, it's a lot more, right? But how much more? So we'll just do a quick primer on bits. So for every 10 bits, a good rule of thumb is add three zeros. So if you have 10 bits, that's 1,000. 20 bits, a million. 30 bits, a billion. Um, and then for basically the low number, 0, 1, 2, 3, you basically can start. So for example, 5 bits means 32, right? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Um, or 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. So if we have five bits, then that's 32. But if we have uh, 15 bits, we take our three zeros and the 32 and you get 32,000. Um, that's a, a quick way to get an approximation of what you're looking for bit-wise. So what is 160 bits, right? You know, you hear people, you know, they crack 110 bits in a year. Well, that just means 111 bits will take two years. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, 128 is still way far off. So 160 bits, if we could, let's say, brute force 100 tri trillion values per second, 160 bits would still take 900 quadrillion eons. I had to look up what an eon was. It's 500 million years. Um, but Brittany will tell you. She knows what's going on. So again, 160 bits. MD, uh, sha one doesn't help us. We still have a 160-bit unique identifier. This is your cookie. It's good that it's big. It's hard to brute force. It's hard for someone else to go and say, you know what, I'm gonna try to guess a random session value of someone else and steal their credentials. Or maybe break into their bank and you know, steal their, uh, you know, transfer some money around. Buy some more girls on brides.ru. Now, let's go over this a little bit more. It's actually not so pseudo-random data. If we look at microseconds, microseconds is only, there are only a million microseconds a second. So you're actually dealing with zero to 999,999. Well, 20 bits, if you remember a rule of thumb, 
there's six zeros, so that's a million. So really, it's not 32 bits, it's actually 20 bits of entropy here. So we, we can actually reduce 12 bits of entropy and reduce from 160 to 148. So that's pretty cool, but 148, still a big number. But there's more, there's more we can do here. Let's say we're on Facebook. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Facebook, you'll know that there's a chat that you can use. And as soon as someone logs into Facebook, they appear on that chat. Well, what is that chat? That's basically an Ajax uh, request that your client is doing every few seconds, and it's checking to see are there new people available, are there people going offline, are they now, uh, are they now away? And when that happens, we get an HTTP response. Uh, using something like live HTTP headers, you can actually watch this in Firefox if you'd like, or TCP dump, or whatever you'd like. And what happens is uh, we send a request, and then we get a response back that says, hey, you know, Matt just logged in, for example. Well, this is interesting. What if I sent, let's say, a request every single second to Facebook? Just an Ajax request with my own program making that HTTP request. And then finally I see someone comes on. Let's see, I see Rsnake, he comes online. Well, the HTTP server will actually send me every response, it sends me the date. Well, that date is the epoch, the server epoch, not my client epoch. So I actually know by checking every second on Facebook, is, someone, is anyone new coming on? Is anyone new coming on? Is anyone new coming on? I know to the second when someone comes online. So that means if, I go, if someone goes onto Facebook, if our snake goes onto Facebook, and he types in his credentials and he logs in, Facebook chat automatically comes up, and I get this, I'm sending my requests every second, I now see the second that he comes on. And if you remember, epoch was a 32 bits. The second thing is, I could send him a link. And if he clicks that link, hopefully it's, it's a non-malicious link at this point, right? It's something totally, uh, there's no XSS, it's just it's some, some web page that I'm able to acquire his IP address from. You know, it's just my blog, for example. And there's nothing malicious. You know, if there were, it wouldn't matter because he's probably blocking it anyway. So he visits my blog, Nambla, and he, uh, <clears throat> and he, and what happens is I watch my Apache logs, and of course I get his IP address. So, if we take a look at that, we just acquired his IP address, 32 bits, and the epoch. Not only the epoch on my client side, not, not when he came on on my computer, which, wouldn't be, which would be beneficial, but not that much, because it's really about when he came on on the server, because it's the server generating these cookies. We just reduced the epoch from the server. It sent, it, sent us that date, and we just reduced another 32 bits. Plus that, negative, that 12 bits uh, from microseconds, we've just reduced 160 bits of random data to 84 bits. That's 76 bits, that's a lot. It's a lot of entropy. So now, the only thing left is the 64 bits, right? We're probably not gonna reduce the microseconds. It's just, it's too much time on the web, dealing with hops, so on and so forth, to try to reduce that. If you work really hard, you probably could. It's not worth it. So let's look at the randomness, or pseudo-randomness. So, if you recall, it calls this LCG value function. An LCG is a, it's called a linear congruential generator. It's a type of pseudo-random number generator. Um, it's been studied for 20, 30 years now. There's a lot of information on it. We can take a look at the LCG in PHP. Now, if we take a look, we started looking at this, and uh, actually, Arshan Diversiagi and Amit Klein uh, pointed me out to, to looking at this stuff. And if we look at the LCG, we start seeing that it's actually really well known. Uh, it's actually really easy to reverse if we want to. And I started going down that path, like, wow, this is, you know, there's so much information on this. Maybe I can reverse this LCG and potentially reverse that random number. Well, that was definitely possible, but was a little difficult. Um, and what I found was there was actually a much easy, there was actually a, a bigger problem that, that was exposed. The seed. The seed of any random number generator is basically what creates all the entropy. When you, create a, when you get a random number in any language, you typically are seeding that random number generator. Your seed is the one piece of random information that all other random numbers come from. If you know the seed at any point, you know every random number that's ever going to come out, in which case it's not even random anymore. 
compute can ever determine a seed, you'll know everything. So it's like the matrix, basically. <laughs> so if we take a look at the seed, basically when we call this LCG value function, it first seeds, if it hasn't seeded already, you typically only ever seed once. It seeds the uh, random number generator, and then we get a random number. Well, let's look at this seed. The seed is 64 bits. Um, and there, there are two values. There's basically this uh, S1 and S2. They're both 32 bits. You see here, let's take a look here. We do a, a get time of day. Let me just take a look at this slide. All right, so we're basically take, taking our, our get time of day. So basically when PHP starts up, or Apache starts up, or whatever is using PHP, we get the time of day. That's the epoch again. What time is it? We take the seconds, we XOR it with the ones complement of the microseconds. Uh, basically, we have 32 bits of entropy there. And we have S2, which is the process ID of PHP. Um, that is the other 32-bit value. Now, let's, let's first take a look at S1. So S1, if we recall, it's this epoch XORed by the ones complement of microseconds. So what's that mean? Uh, basically, we have epoch the number of seconds in a day. That's hard to guess, right? It's hard to guess what time it is that Apache started, at least accurately. We might know that it probably started maybe in the last week or something like that. Um, but they're also using microseconds, which we'll never be able to guess. It's, just, it's too difficult to guess, you know, one in a million what they're, what they're using. And they use that to also XOR the, the seconds. The problem is they're taking the most variable data, the microseconds, and XORing it against the most variable part of the time. Well, in time, we, we know what year Apache probably started. We probably know what month. We might even know what day, probably not. But we know what month and year. But we don't know, let's say, what minute or hour. Well, that minute and hour gets randomized with the microseconds. So the data we didn't know is still data we don't know now that it gets XORed with this microseconds. The data we do know, for example, the, uh, the year and the month, we still know. So the very static fixed data remains the same. If we basically take the top and bottom possible microseconds and randomize our epoch with it, we get a difference of 12 days. What this means is if I can determine within a 12-day period of when Apache started or when this PHP process started, I can know what S1 is up to, tw uh, basically, I can reduce 12 bits from there because 12 bits of static information gets me 12 days. Now, what if I don't know within 12 days? You know, we have servers that are running for months, if not, you know, let's assume months, right? Well, most web servers we can actually just send many, many requests to, and what happens? Well, typically there's a, a maximum number of servers that we can run at, uh, that will handle so many responses or, or requests. After, you know, so many thousand requests, it'll start over. So if you want to make a server restart, you just send many, many, many requests. It doesn't affect the users or anything like that. It simply respawns a new process. From then, we know exactly when it started, at least to the day. So we just reduced our 64-bit seed to 52 bits. Now, if we look at S2, that's the process ID. We all know process IDs, they're not too random. One problem here is it's 32-bit. This is 32 bits of the seed. Well, Linux only uses 15 bits for process IDs. So immediately, you're reducing 17 bits, just off the, off the bat without knowing anything about the system. If you can execute PHP, if you can find a vulnerability, or if you can get somehow local access to the system um, and do a PS, if you can execute PHP and get the process ID, if you can find the, uh, an Apache page that shows processes or shows the process ID of Apache running, you get the process ID. You now reduce the full 32 bits of S2. We take S2, which we now know the process ID, zero bits of entropy, plus the 20 bits of entropy from the microseconds, and we now have 20 bits of entropy total within the random number generator. So let's take a look. We have We've reduced everything but microseconds of when the cookie was established, and we've reduced everything but microseconds of when Apache or PHP started, so a total of 40 bits. We reduced 120 bits of entropy in that cookie. It's amazing. 
But wait, there's more. <laughs> what we can do is we can actually take that seed value of the LCG, the 20 bits that we didn't know of when Apache started, and we can brute force that separately. We don't have to make it 40 bits. We can actually make it 20 and 20 bits, which is technically 21 bits. By brute forcing that 20 bits um, offline, which I provi provide code for doing, you can basically reduce in seconds, literally seconds, using a time memory trade-off to uh, reduce the entire thing down to 20 bits total. What this means is I can reduce your cookie to 20 bits or just over a million possible cookies and guess which cookie is yours. I can predict cookies at this point. What this means is, on average, with 500,000 HTTP requests, which is not hard to do in a day, I can now log in as you. Great success. I send 500,000 cookies uh, and uh, I now log in as you. So now I'm logged in as rsnake, sorry buddy. Um, and now I can do whatever I want. Literally 500,000 requests on average, a, a little over a million total. This is, this is scary. Um, at this point, I can email Anna as rsnake and start to set some things up. So I let her know to check out my, my website and help with my farm bill. Now, how do we fix this? All right, so PHP 5.3.2, um, I spoke to uh, the, P the PHP guys and they, they added more entropy, so that, that's awesome. Um, if you want more entropy, create your own session values. You know, one of the things about PHP is it's meant to be fast, right? They, they, they want it to be fast and portable. So they don't use things like, for example, dev you random. They may in the future, but they don't for the entropy right now. So use your own entropy. Create your own seed if you want. I'm not telling you to go and create your own crypto, saying use your own seed from randomness that you know is better than the randomness that's used around you. This attack is also difficult to execute. You're not gonna be able to hack your bank overnight. You might, if they have a social network as part of it. It's <laughs> kinda like a cool new bank, like Virgin Bank or something. Um, Facebook is not vulnerable to this. Let me just say that now. Uh, Facebook is not vulnerable. Please don't put me in jail again. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't do anything. This was, it was all, it was all uh, shopped. So Facebook uses hip hop. Their sessions are not using session start, but most things do. Cake PHP uses session start. By default, your PHP application probably uses a session start. Make sure you're an up to date PHP. Use more randomness if you can. Help my farm. Grow some crops for me. So at this point, I emailed Anna. We're bonding. Um, as Robert. And I, and I got her to hit a link. Ooh, a link. Right? This goes back to the web browser. So I'm going to attack her network now. So, so you guys are familiar with this is your network. Right? This is your network on drugs. <laughs> well, you too. So we're gonna talk about a NAT right now and how to break a NAT. So this is a NAT. This is your home NAT. Your NAT basically allows you to run multiple systems behind one public IP address, you know, in a nutshell. Um, we won't go into it much further than that. So you'll have private IP addresses back here. You know, let's say this is your system, or this is Anna's system, as you can tell. And she's running behind this NAT. It doesn't matter if you have, let's say, uh, ports running on, on your system. If you have services running, for example, you're running Apache or whatever, it doesn't matter. Your NAT will actually block it out unless you're doing port forwarding or using a DMZ. Um, but, yeah, that's it for this slide. So what we're gonna talk about first is something called XPS, cross-protocol scripting. Uh, you may have heard of it recently. Uh, it was made kind of big by uh, a well-respected group called GOATC Security. Um, so cross-protocol scripting. Basically, with an HTTP server, you can run it on any port. Um, a, little, a little more information here. With a hidden form, we can 
we can basically submit data to any port to any HTTP server. What's interesting about this is HTTP is a new line based protocol. What that means is when you're doing HTTP requests, every, every piece of data is on a new line. Now there are other protocols that work like this. SMTP for example, when you connect to an SMTP server you say, you know, hello uh, and a bunch of other stuff and you say, I want to send mail, re uh, recipient, body or data, so on and so forth. Um, IRC also works this way. So the cool thing is you can actually talk to an IRC server, make your browser think that it's an HTTP server, and your browser will first send the HTTP request, and in the content or in the post data, send IRC commands. What will happen is the IRC server will actually look at that HTTP response and be like, I don't know what this is, ignore, 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 until it gets to valid commands that it understands, and then execute those. So, in this example, we're just telnetting to an IRC server. We basically, to display, demonstrate how new line-based protocols look, we send something like user Sammy, 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 Nick, Sammy, might have to respond to a ping request. We join a channel, and then we ask them where to get WinNuke. It doesn't work anymore, I tried it. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so at this point, this is how you would actually produce that in HTTP. We can actually, most of this can technically be in, uh, in HTML, but here's a, a JavaScript version. We can basically create a form. Um, we say where that form is gonna get posted to. We're gonna post to an HTTP server called fnet.org, or irc.fnet.org on port 6667. And then we're gonna use multi-part form, multi form data so we can send basically post content that doesn't get URI encoded It'll be the data that we want to send to the server. Um, we send the data that we want, and then we go ahead and submit the form. What we see is this. Our client, our browser, creates this connection to an IRC server. The IRC server doesn't understand any of this stuff. Ignores, 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 oh, I understand these commands. And then it goes and executes that. One of the dangers of this is you could write for years and years and years, there have been spammers using this. Um, I don't know how many people know about this or how many spammers even know about this, but basically what was happening was you would have a website that ha got a lot of traffic, and someone would visit that website, and on that website was code, this type of code. And it would connect, each time you hit that website, it would connect to a random mail server, and then send an SMTP message through that mail server. Now, you can't, it's much harder to block that spam because it's coming from random IP addresses. It's all of you who are visiting the website that your browser is now acting as a mail client. Um, it's really dangerous because now you have all these random IP addresses that you can't necessarily control. So, what is NAT pinning? That's what I'll be talking about. It's like XPS times over 9,000. It's really cool. So, where XPS confuses the browser, it makes your browser think you're communicating with an HTTP server. NAT pinning also confuses your router. So you, when you're communicating with port 6667, your browser thinks it's HTTP, but your router thinks it's IRC, which is sort of true, right? It's a mix at that point. So what happens is Anna Ferris clicks on that link. She goes to some malicious server that was supposed to be HP. I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> and she hits a, a, web, a web page, that web page has a hidden form, and then it does a JavaScript submit of that form, which then connects to, say, an IRC server. All right, well, we just talked about that. That's cross-protocol cross scripting. You know, those, those respectable goatsy guys told us all about that. Um, so what else can we do? Well, IRC is a cool protocol. Uh, if you're familiar with IRC, you may be familiar with DCC chats or DCC file sense. DCC is basically a direct client connection. It allows you to make a direct connection from you to the person you are chatting with or you want to send a file with, rather than going through the middleman of the IRC server. You might not want the IRC server to know what you're talking about with that person in Russia. Um, so you'll use a DCC connection. Now, for a while, DCC connections wouldn't really work as NATs were becoming more and more prevalent. IRC is an extremely old protocol. So what router manufacturers started doing was they started creating uh, 
they started creating connection tracking. So if they saw an IRC connection, they would say, oh, this looks like IRC. Uh, this guy's probably gonna have you know, some wholesome fun in teen chat. And what I will do is I will monitor this connection. And if I ever see my person behind my NAT trying to connect to, let's say, a direct person somewhere else, what I'll do is I will open that port. The way DCC works is you say, I wanna chat this person, and I want them to connect back to me on this port. That's where I'm waiting for their direct connection. But if you're behind a router, your router is gonna block that connection when that user comes back to connect, right? NATs by default will block incoming connections. So when routers now see this, and you can actually see some source code, for example, in Linux, if you take a look at this code right here, this will show you the connection tracking for IRC. There's connection tracking for other protocols as well, FTP, SIP, so on and so forth. Now, when the router sees this message, you know, a private message, I want to DCC chat this person and I want them to connect back on this port, well, it will open that port. So the router opens that port and sends it back to the client. What if I said, private message, uh, I connect to you know, an IRC server and I say, you know, I want someone to connect to me on port 22, SSH, to see this file. Your router will open up port 22 and forward it to me or back to the client. The cool thing about this is it's not a client, it was your web browser. You just visited my malicious website. I had a form on my website that told, that said, oh, I'm gonna connect to this IRC server via a JavaScript form. It then connects, it sends this one message, I'm gonna DCC chat, that's your client doing this, your browser, and I want them to connect back to me on port 22. Your router sees this and says, I better let that person back in when they connect. It then port forwards port 22 to your system behind your NAT. I just broke into your NAT. And I can connect you on any port that you have. If you have a NAT, you're not safe. <laughs> this is what happens. When you're running SendMail from 1982 on your computer, and you're like, ah, oh, I'm behind a router, it's fine, behind my firewall. You're not. People will connect, even if they're not on your router. This can happen. It's amazing, it's really cool. So here's, uh, here's an example code that will actually do just this. It will open up any port you want, you just set the port variable. You set 22, you could set 80, 443, whatever you want. And now you can now connect to that person who visited your website through their firewall. Now what about block ports? So as this became more and more, uh, a little bit more prevalent, not NAT pinning specifically, but um, people abusing IRC. Uh, what some browsers started doing was saying, oh, you know what, I'm not gonna let you connect to 6667. That's a, that's a well-known IRC port. You're obviously up to some trouble. So we're gonna block port 6667. Well, the great guys at Goatsy figured out that you can do something pretty cool. You can overflow the integer and just add 65,536 to it, add one extra bit, when it hits the browser code in WebKit, for example, it checks, does the port equal 6667? No, it doesn't, because it's this big number. But by the time it gets to the IP stack, it gets overflown to your 32 bits, and it gets back to 6667, just ignoring that whole, uh, that whole block. At this point, I, I believe it's fixed in all WebKit browsers, but for a time it was, a, it was an issue. I'm not sure if, if it's still, if it's still uh, around. So, NAT pinning plus integer overflow gets you to basically, you may not even need the integer overflow. You can now break into people's NATs, break into their firewalls, connect to them on any port that they thought they were securely running behind their firewall, and just start attacking. Have fun. Um, so at this point, poor Anna, she was running a web server. What was she doing that for? So I got to go to her website behind her, uh, behind her router. That's, is that Anna? I think so. And uh, apparently she loves Twilight just like me. And Arshan, actually Arshan is also a big Twilight guy. Um, we're, kind of, we're kind of fighting right now. He's on Team Edward, I'm on Team Jacob. <laughs> but so is Anna, so is Anna. So, thinking, man, and now I know how to seal the deal, right? Team Jacob, I mean, it's, it's meant to be. I'm sorry, Arsnake. It's, it's meant to be. 
So, you know, I read her blog. It's, it's great. It's good stuff. I love Twilight. And at this point, we should know, you know, how do you stop nat pinning? I normally don't like to talk about defense, but okay, for you guys. Let's try to stop it. Have a strict firewall. Um, you know, you can turn off connection tracking a lot of browsers, uh, routers, excuse me. You can turn it off in NATs, uh, some NATs. So turn it off if you can. Um, make sure you're running up-to-date browsers so that you have, you know, the patches for, for example, integer overflows and things like that. Make sure you're just running up-to-date browser. Use no script if you can. Um, if you're using Firefox, you know, try to protect yourself as much as possible. You know, there's, you guys understand there's no catch-all to, to full protection. Just use as many layers as you can, as I will with Anna. <laughs> so now that I know Anna's interests, I might as well send her another message as our snake. Really seal the deal. I'm going to let her know, you know what? My friend Sammy's going to come over. He's a good guy. I'm out of town. I'm at Black Hat. I'm flying back to meet her tonight. Um, and, you know, actually, go check his Twitter, Nambla slash Twitter. And so hopefully she'll be expecting me. And, you know, luckily I had a, a, her boyfriend saying, oh, he's a good guy, you know, social proof. I'm sure you guys are all social engineers, asking me my passwords. So the moment you've all been waiting for, right? Triple X, S, S. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. Don't worry, he'll, he'll keep it on. <laughs> My final attack, I think the coolest attack. We're going to do geolocation. All right, that's not that interesting, whatever. You can do a who is lookup on Aaron look up an IP address, find out kind of the vicinity of where the person is, and then you can, you know, then you can do advertising to them. Um, you know, often when I'm on reputable news sites, I see, you know, local girls in LA want to talk to you. Um, you guys are all familiar with that, right? No? <laughs> I, I'm the only one who goes to those reputable, reputable news sites. So what geolocation via triple X S S. Anna Vinit visits my malicious site because I, I Facebook messaged her. And she trusted me because I was someone else after I broke his PHP sessions. Now, she visits my malicious site, and this triple XSS scans the local network, her lo local network for the type of router she's using. How does it do that? It's actually really simple. This is old info. Um, create an iframe, for example. This is just one way of doing it. There are many. Create your iframe, make it hidden, and you point to an internet URL, basically a local, uh, local IP on your network, something that I can never access, but you as a client within your NAT can access. So it's a 192.168 address, for example. Now I'm hitting here, setup.cgi, and I do an onload. What this says is, if I can hit this, if your browser, Anna, can hit this URL, that means you probably have a built-in router. Well, if it can't hit that, it'll never hit my onload JavaScript. What if I can hit this 192.168.11 index.cgi? Then you're probably running a Fios router, for example. The list goes on. So you can basically detect any HTTP-based HTTP router. All right, that's cool. What next? Well, do any of, you, are any of you have routers or have people who have routers and they're like, you know, I never really changed the admin credentials because the only way to get onto my routers, you have to be either physically plugged in, so you're either in my house or my dungeon downstairs or whatever you guys have. And, or you know my WPA password, for example. Uh, hopefully not web password. So how are they going to be able to access you know, my internet? They're not going to. They're not going to be able to log in. So they don't, set, you know, they don't change admin, admin, or fa my favorite password, change me. Um, and they just leave it for the router. I'm not talking about WPA. I'm talking about admin credentials for your router. Well, what if you visit a malicious website? And it detects what router you have, and then again, creates a form, and then submits. You can now log into someone's router. You can log into the router with their default credentials, even though you're not on their network, you don't have access to their network, all you're doing is their 
their web browser is propelling this vulnerability and basically propelling this exploit for you. Pretty cool. Now, this isn't necessarily necessary in our geolocation triple XSS attack. So what happens? Anna visits the site. We scan for the router type. If necessary, depending on the router, we may need to log try to log in. We may not even need to log in at all. Then we XSS the router. All right, so we're going to XSS the router and load remote malicious JavaScript. So for example, this is a real exploit on Fios routers where it uh, hits an XSS and then it accesses a remote URL with JavaScript. Accesses that JavaScript. What's that JavaScript do? Well, being a router, you have a MAC address. Your, every network device has a MAC address. And that's, it's similar to an IP address. It's basically the unique identifier for the piece of hardware that you have. Now, the MAC address typically is not a big deal. Knowing that MAC address, it's not big information. It's kind of like knowing an IP address. It just tells you sort of where something is. You can't really communicate with anything by a MAC address on the internet. You can only do that internally on your network um, in general. Now, we use this remote JavaScript to basically access a local page on the router, uh, basically a system information page, for example. So what we'll do is we'll use this uh, Ajax thing I learned about a couple years ago, accidentally, and we will access the system info and pull the MAC address and then send it to me. So Anna visits the website, loads this malicious JavaScript, it accesses your router's MAC address and sends it directly to me. All right. That's nice, but why MAC address? Like, what's so cool about that? All right, so if you don't know, just Bing it, right? Here, I'll help you. Open your browser, type www.bing.com, all right? When the search box opens, type in Google, <laughs> and hit enter, okay? I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> oh, Google. They know everything. <laughs> Does this look familiar? <laughs> it was spying on me once, late with Anna. Um, this is the Google Street View card. There's only one. <laughs> it has a sweet camera. What it does is it tracks you wherever you go. There's one right there. Look. <laughs> Maybe look. Uh, you guys know Street View. You know, you go to Google Maps and uh, you, type in a, you type in an address, Planned Parenthood, and you go and you say, oh, uh, you know, you can see Street View. Yeah, it's on that side of the street. You know exactly where it is. Well, these cars, what they do is they go around. It's really interesting. They go around driving. I would hate to be this guy driving down every single street in America. And as they're doing that, they're taking pictures all over. It's really a guy holding a camera. <laughs> you think he was foreign, like, ooh, America. And as they're doing this, one thing people don't really know is they're also watching Wi-Fi. Now, recently, a big Wi-Fi Google thing came up that you guys may have heard of. Basically, they were, uh, they were getting all this unencrypted information accidentally. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> and they were storing it. Oops. I had no idea we had petabytes of information on here. Um, and that became a big thing, but that's actually not what we're going to be looking at. I'm not worried about that data that they were finding on unencrypted networks. I care about the data they were finding on encrypted networks. While they're driving, not only are they taking pictures, they're doing something else. They're watching the Wi-Fi networks. And they're watching the Wi-Fi packets. And within the Wi-Fi packets are your MAC address, uh, specifically the MAC address of the router, right? the device that we just acquired recently. Now, if you remember, well, actually, as they're driving, they're also tracking GPS. GPS is very accurate. Another cool thing about Wi-Fi is their signal strength. You can know how strong something is, whether you get closer to it or whether you get further to it. If you have an iPhone, for example, there are five bars, and using an iPhone, you'll only ever have one or two in America. <laughs> so you know whether you're closer to that, uh, to that signal or not. Um, it's really weird. Here at Black Hat, I have five bars. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. 
The quality is crystal clear, though. So what they're doing is they're actually tracking these Wi-Fi MAC addresses, the MAC addresses of your router. They're driving down the street, and they're saying, ooh, I see a signal. You know, that, that network says Linksys. But it's kind of far. The signal is maybe a 10 out of 100. They're driving further and further down the street. Oh, it's 50 out of 100. They drive further and further. Now it's 90 out of 100. They must be really close to that signal. Now it's going less. Now it's back to 80. Using very simple triangulation, they're determining exactly where that router is. And then as they go to the next street, they can, again, they're getting more signal strength information. And literally, they're doing triangulation to determine where your MAC address is. Now, how do you access this information? If you've been using Firefox, I'm not sure uh, if anyone has seen this, but there's something called location services in Firefox. It's, uh, it's a feature that you can use JavaScript and determine where someone is. Now, don't worry too much. What happens is, if you go to a page that attempts to access this information, it'll ask you. It's nice. It'll, you'll have a little bar that says, do you want this information, or this website is trying to get information about your location. Would you like to share it? Most of you would click no. Uh, unless you want to meet single girls tonight, in which case you might click yes. So the problem is, I'm never going to get Anna to click that information, click that box. Um, I tried. She didn't. So what's something else we can do? Well, if you, uh, if you actually look at what's going on, when you click that button, share location, Firefox, what it's doing is make uh, an HTTPS request to Google, because they know everything. And at that point, it sends the router information. Firefox is actually built so that it has code that determines uh, the MAC address of your router, your gateway, and also any other routers that it sees. And it sends that to Google. And then Google responds, oh, here are the coordinates. Now again, this isn't very helpful to us because the mo we can't be very malicious about it because it's going to ask us. Now, that's only if we don't know the MAC address. We know the MAC address. If you recall, Anna sent, her, sent me her MAC address as she visited my malicious site. My malicious site with a triple XSS, which then looked for any router on her network, determined the type of router, potentially logged in, used an XSS, accessed remote malicious JavaScript, which then did an AJAX request to the router, got the MAC address, sent it to me to remote URL, now I have her MAC address. I then take that URL, I connect to Google, I send this response, I include her MAC address, and now I get her coordinates. Her exact coordinates. Jack Bauer triangulation type. I mean, <laughs> tell me where Anna Ferris is. That's exactly what he said. This is how accurate this is, by the way. This is where Anna Ferris is. I took Anna Ferris's location right here, that uh, blue, blue circle. I'm serious now. This is, this is actual exploitation of this. And then I compared it to the actual address, that, where she really was. Driving directions to Casa de Ferris, 30 feet. 30 feet. I looked over at the router. It was 30 feet away. I'm serious. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, no, th this is actually a router that I exploited. And it literally told me the router was 30 feet away from me. I went to this web, malicious website that I set up without doing anything else, and it told me exactly where I was. Exactly. This is geolocation just gone terrible. <laughs> Privacy is dead, people. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take uh, any questions. I'll also provide links to all of the code for all of these different, uh, different techniques. Can you just go to a bar? I'm sorry? Can you just go to a bar? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and pick up Anna Ferris, yeah, at a bar. OK. <laughs> I'm sorry? Repeat the questions. Oh, questions? When, when, when they ask, repeat them. Oh, OK, got it. Yes? Um, with regards to the Yes. 
That's right. You might not be hitting the right server. Um, there's a couple things you want to do. You will want to do, uh, A, you'll want to do an HTTP keep alive so that when you're attacking the server, you always remain on the same connection and you remain on the same process. Um, that is a good point. You may not know what server he's on. So there are, I think there are some ways around that, uh, especially if there's like an Apache server info page. Uh, you can get some information and predict that. That also has like process IDs. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. So it is a, t it is a tough attack. When you bypass the NAT, I'm sorry? Well, when you, uh, when you go through the NAT and you get the uh, local host to do Yes. Well, if they have cookies, you know, you can do standard XSS um, and, and CSRF and, and things like that. Oh, you can do so much, honestly. You can change. Yeah. So, it, it, so if you're if you're able to penetrate that NAT and get them to um, access their router, yeah, you can actually get them to change their DNS information, for example. And from then on, you can control all DNS. You know, from then on, if they go to bankofamerica.com, you could say, oh, bankofamerica.com happens to go an IP address that also resolved to NAMBLA. And then from there, you can do whatever you want. Some URLs. Thanks, Robert. You're awesome, by the way. Uh, Shout out to Robert for taking it. Yeah, all right.